Hi everyone, Dave here. Uh, thanks for coming along to another episode of the podcast. Uh, now on Legends of the Spy today, I spoke to Ricky Heppelet. Um, he moved over from India when he was just a toddler, setting up roots in the Northwest, started his career at Preston North End before spells at Leighton Orient and Crystal Palace, uh, before coming to Chesterfield uh, to spend time with us in the second half of the 1970s. Uh, he was a tricky player uh, with a lot of skill, uh, definitely played his part uh, during his time at the club under Arthur Cox. Um, did suffer a few injuries as well as he was one of those um, all-in type of players who would throw himself in for a tackle given the opportunity. Um, he's had a really interesting career outside of football as well, um, starting up a balloon business um, and also investing in Garfield. Um, so really interesting to have a chat with him. Uh, as always, we are at Spire Legends on Twitter and Legends of the Spire on Facebook and also Legends of the Spire at Outlook.com if you want to email. Um, but here we are with the latest episode of Legends of the Spire with the one and only Ricky Heppelet. So before we get to Chesterfield, it's just nice to get a bit of a context of, of the player before they got to Chesterfield. So you, right. you started off at Preston, didn't you? Started at Preston. Uh, I was 15 when I joined uh, Preston North End. Um, and again, is that I knew I was going to play football. It, it wasn't a case of you must have a plan B, you must do this, you're not going to do that. I never thought like that. I don't think like that. I just focus on one thing and I knew it was, that's what I was going to do. And I went, uh, you didn't, in those days, the scouting uh, for football wasn't that rife like it is today. So if you showed a bit of promise, you got invited to trial. So I got invited to, to come for trial at Preston I got quite a few trials. I was very lucky. I was living in Bolton in Lancashire and I got invited to a lot of trials, Preston, Southampton, Manchester City, uh, Burnley, Everton. But I, I only went to two. I went, my first trial, I went to Southampton and that's the other side of the world or it was then because the motorways weren't good. So my father put me on the train and it was the first time really I'd been out of Preston. So I went to, uh, some, um, to Southampton and stayed there for two weeks. And it was a good two weeks and they wanted me to sign. But being 14, 15, never been anywhere, I was just terribly homesick. It sounds dreadful now, but it was a different world completely. And they put me in with a landlady who was lovely. Everything was perfect. They wanted to sign me. But believe me, is uh, it was just too far away. Mm. And they had some good players that were in the, the old first division then. So it, it, was, it was a very, very good team. But there was no way I could sign. So the next stop was Preston. I went for a trial there. And... Um, it was it was ideal. It was twenty miles from from Bolton, and uh, they wanted me. So yes, I signed. But if truth be known, my my first choice was Bolton Wanderers, which was my hometown. But uh, I got lots of trials. But Bolton never offered me a trial whatsoever. I was on their doorstep, and I was desperate for for. To go over there, my hometown, but the offer never came, unfortunately. So I signed for Preston, and it was wonderful because your first love is your real love. And I had a great time, and I think I stayed till I was 22. And uh, I loved it. I loved everything about it. And the only reason I left because they needed money, and they had to sell two or three players to survive. And I was one of them. And I then went to Orient, but Preston was great. I had a great time and it taught me lots of things about football, about growing up, about everything. It was a great time, believe me. It was like, it was like a, a dream world, but it was just wonderful. Yeah. Um, and I read as well in, a, um, in an interview that you did about how your mum and dad came to like, as many matches as they could, even when you had a 
you had a spell, didn't you, at um, you know down down at a Lake Orient and Palace and and places like that? They kind of try to travel around. They, no, they didn't come whenever they could. They came every match. <laughs> so there wasn't a case of we're working, we're doing this, we're doing that. They would work around football and they work their jobs around football. So we could be playing, for argument's sake, they were living still in Bolton and I was at Orient or Preston and we played Plymouth in a midweek on a Wednesday night in, in whatever, a cup match. And they would travel from Bolton to Plymouth on a Wednesday night, raining in a little Ford popular car. And they'd get home about four o'clock in the morning and still be at work for eight o'clock. They never never missed one match. Didn't say, uh, well, we can't do this, we can't. They, they came to every single match. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. So they were obviously really supportive of you becoming a footballer in the very, first very, very, very supportive. Um, Dad kept everything. Dad kept every programme, every little paper cutting. Um, the whole, we could have a big, big write-up, a whole page in, in whatever paper it was. And right at the bottom, it would say, and Ricky Heplet played, to keep the whole paper. <laughs> so we, I had loads, I had everything, believe me. And in the end, I said, no, we can't keep all this. So a lot of that, I gave all the programs away and the cuttings. And, so, yeah. To by Preston in red here. They were on their way up from the third division, along with their opponents here, Fulham. Roy got the back header, Hebelet! What a good goal by Hebelet! And, and, and after Preston, so you were there at Preston until 73, I think, and then you, you did have a spell at Lake Norian and Palace as well. Um, Went to Lake uh, Norian and... Um... Two things is that, and that was another good club, another friendly, small club, but it was a good, good club. And I was very lucky to fit in nicely. I moved to London. Uh, I bought a house in Rayleigh, which was near South End in Essex, hmm. because some, some of the boys lived over there. And... Um, it was, again, had a, had a great time over there. We had a little bit of success over there, but I fitted in. It was perfect. I enjoyed my time there, I must admit. Yeah. And, and tell us about what kind of player you were. Describe your kind of style of play. Well, I was, I was a great trier. I, I was fit and healthy. I didn't drink. Did I chase? Yes, I chased the women, but I didn't drink. And I was always super, super fit because I trained really hard. Um, so that was my game. I was a super trier. I was. I loved the physical side of it. So it didn't matter if there was a 50-50 tackle. I used to break everything, believe me. I used to have a season ticket for hospitals. And uh, I used to break everything, my nose, my leg, my arm because I would just throw myself into it. My game was all about um, endeavour and what I liked in skill, I used to, to run about and get involved in everything. So I, I always got in the team, you know, not necessarily because one of the more skillful, but I was a, a, a super fighter and a super trier. So yeah. that's why I was always in the team. Yeah, it's funny as well, actually, because I was talking to a Chesterfield supporter last week and he yeah. was saying that at the matches, he sits next to someone um, yeah. who, whenever the ball get, is delivered across the box and no one's there at the far post, yeah. this guy next to him always says, Ricky Heppelet would have been there on the far post because he was always really good at ghosting in at the far post. But well, yes, I, uh, I, I did. I, I, I enjoyed, I was good at uh, leaping and heading the ball and I can get it up to a good height. And the only reason is, is that my timing was good. And uh, if there was a bigger lad than me, I would always make sure I jumped first and, and basically lent over him mm. so I could always get to the ball first. But I loved it. I loved being fit and healthy. It was a great, super great life. 
you didn't have a care in the world. All you had to do is be fit and healthy, which was great. And that, that was part of my game. So I loved it. Yeah. And you came to Chesterfield then. So it was, uh, so it was 1976? 76. Well, the, the, let's go back to Preston North End, first of all. Mm. We got relegated. Uh, we played our last game of the season in the second division against Blackpool at home. And Blackpool was only 10 miles away. They had to win to go up in the first division. We had to win to survive in the second division. Unfortunately, we lost the game and we went down into the third division. And then they appointed Alan Ball Sr. as manager and Arthur Cox as his assistant manager. Uh -huh. So I knew Arthur Cox very, very well because Arthur and I were, were very, very close. And uh, he was a good man. He was, uh, he was like an old-fashioned sergeant major. He wanted his things his way. Alan Ball would let him have the run of the coaching and... He was a real disciplinarian. So, but he liked it because I used to run and to fight and to tackle. So we always got on well. What were your kind of first impressions then joining Chesterfield? Did it all come about then? Was it Arthur Cox kind of got in touch with you then? Arthur Cox got in contact with me. Um, I never really, unfortunately, I didn't settle at Crystal Palace. And that wasn't anybody's fault. If anything, is that... It's, it was one of my regrets, really, that I should have fought harder. I should have worked harder, everything. But I was still living in South End, and that was a major problem because mm -hmm. it was a two-hour journey, um, probably a little bit more than two hours, uh, by train to, to get there. And I couldn't really sell my house in South End or it took a long, long time. So I had to keep traveling. Mm. And so I had to, probably about a two and a half hour journey there, two and a half hour journey back. And really I should have insisted on staying there in digs or whatever. But it was a, it was a regret of mine that I didn't make a success of it because Terry Venable signed me. And he was a, he was a great man, he was a lovely man. There was no pressure but he was very knowledgeable about things. And he was, he was just a, a good all round man. He could laugh, he could sing, he can dance. His football knowledge was wonderful. And the training sessions. So it never lasted, but really it was down. I should have insisted that I came and lived over there and gone home at weekends. That's what I should have done. That's, that was in a, re a regret. And funny enough, we played at Chester. He sold me to Chesterfield. And Terry was, he was just a good man. And I remember at Chesterfield, we played Palace. Um, and after the match, he came in special to the Chesterfield dressing room. And I was in the shower. So he waited till I finished, came out, sat with me. And we had a chat for about 15, 20 minutes. And people don't do that, you see. He said he was a busy man. He had to get back to London, but he made time. And I just thought, what a nice little touch that is. And I wasn't even, I'd left Palace by then, you see. But he, he just, uh, I thought he was a great England manager. And uh, I, I think um, he had lots and lots of flair. He knew about the game. He could talk about the game and make it sound interesting. Mm. So we played just a funny story at, um, at Palace. We played Liverpool in the FA Cup. And uh, we we're in the dressing room at Liverpool, which we, we drew nothing in. And he was just saying is that this is, this is wonderful. This is what we're here for. This is what you... This is life. This is, it doesn't get any better than this. And then he turned around and he just said a funny thing. He said, this is better than sex. And everybody went quiet. He said, and for those of you who have not had sex, that's not bad either. <laughs> but that's what, he just loved it. Being in the dressing room, being in big places. He said, this is what we aspire to do. 
And uh, so enjoy this moment. They make me glad. They make me sad. They make me want a lot of things that I've never had. You're fooling around. <laughs> You alone some night, and baby, you find you're messing with dynamite. So, why do you want to make those eyes at me for if they don't mean what they say? But he was a good man. He's now in, uh, he's now got a big hotel in Spain that he uh, he runs, it's his own, and uh, so yeah, good, good man, Terry. Do you reckon you could still get a free room, get a, get a free holiday? I, I think he probably, I'll probably ring up and you'll say, Ricky who? <laughs> what do you mean, Ricky who? Anyway, but yeah, a long time ago. But he was, a, he was a good, funny man. Where Arthur Cox was a very serious man. Everything was very, very serious. He had, he had um, um, a haircut like they've got now with no hair, all shaved back. Before it became fashionable, mm. he would wear tracksuit bottoms, very very tight, like they do nowadays. Which what it wasn't fashionable. He would do everything his way, and again, he, he just his word was law. He wanted it done his way, and uh, I remember we played a game at Chesterfield, and. Um, I don't know who we, we, we lost 2-0, we were expected to win. And the chairman came in ranting and raving and, and Arthur just very calmly said, Mr. Chairman, he said, I'll see you later. And basically threw him out the dressing room, <laughs> okay, locked the door. This is not the time, I'll speak to you later. He was, he was in control, Arthur. He, was, uh, he didn't sort of rant and rave uh, at all times. He would be... He had everything under control his way. Yeah. I enjoyed his manners. Uh, it I've, was good. I've heard about his uh, kind of cross-country uh, runs as well, out, out in the peak and taking you out for we, a run. He used to, uh, we used to go and uh, I, was, I was club captain. And he would say to me in front of everybody, he said, right, Ricky, what do we want? Do we want a hard one or an easy one? And I knew no matter what we, I said, we were going to get the hard one, no matter what I said. OK, so I said, oh, yeah, we want the hard one, boss. He said, right answer, because that's what we we're going to do anyway. Mm. And uh, the story I have of uh, Steve Osgrovich joined us and he was a policeman. And Steve was probably six, four. And he was he, Steve didn't take any nonsense. And uh, he joined us probably on uh, pre-season. And uh, off we went on a cross country. And Steve was trying to do his best because he wasn't used to full time training. So Steve did his best to keep up. Uh, now I had to start off the last man because I was uh, team captain, club captain, and see everybody make sure. So we all got back to their finishing line after about an hour and a half, two hours, whatever. So I had to make sure we counted everybody up because we were about five or six miles away from the football ground in Chesterfield and make sure everybody was accounted for. And of course, there's one man short and uh, somebody said, it's Steve Osgorovic, boss. Uh, I saw him fall at the first fence and I just sort of said, no problem, boss. I'll wait for him and I'll take him in the car. Now, I, I don't know if you can bleep this out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Arthur just turned around to me and I said, I'll wait for him, boss, and I'll bring him home. And Arthur says, fuck him. Right? <laughs> Which meant, let him make his own way home. Okay? And remember, he's only joined the club a week ago, but that was his mentality. You know, if he can't keep up, he's got to pay the price. But just the way he turned around to me and said, F him. Right, which meant let him die. He'll learn. And remember, he's six foot four. So, but so it was a lesson straight away. 
that uh, we all knew, and Steve certainly knew about, that uh, he had to keep up or die. <laughs> and as, as kind of club captain then, did you quite enjoy being the bridge between the boss and the, and the rest of the players? Yeah, yeah, I did really. There was, uh, it was, it was, it wasn't really. Arthur made the decisions and you couldn't change his mind. He, that's what he wanted. This is what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. So we'd say different things. This is what, I think we can do this. I can do it. And he'd listen, but he'd still do it his own way. So there was no really room for discussions, anything. He decided this is the way it's going to be. That's the way. he will listen. And he was a great listener, okay? Mm -hmm. That he wouldn't sort of uh, shout you out or uh, anything. He'd listen to you, but he wouldn't do. He'd only do what he wanted to do. Yeah. And, and you actually, I think you actually made your debut for Chesterfield against Sheffield Wednesday, I think. I think it was a home, yeah. home win against yeah. Sheffield Wednesday, which is a, a good derby match to make your debut. Which, which was a good derby match, absolutely. And it was, uh, it was a full house. And I think uh, Sheffield Wednesday brought five, six, ten thousand, whatever. But again, they were a big uh, club at that time and they expected big, better things. But yeah, it was, it was a good match to make my debut. So, yes, I, I enjoyed it. They put me in, uh, I went and they put me into the station hotel. Is that still about? Uh, it's probably it's probably renamed now, but I think it's yeah, I think it's the one what the one it's, right near the train station, not too far from the train station. Yeah. So I think I was in there for about hmm, probably probably about four months, four or five months, and that was a nice time as well. I enjoyed Chesterfield immensely. You know, it was a slow way of life. Everybody was friendly, and I always say is that. Uh, and I hope people in Chesterfield don't get too annoyed with this. Everything stopped for a cup of tea over there. You know, they, they didn't rush. Everybody had time. We'd stop and we'd have a cup of tea. And hey, that's how we went on. Um, but I loved it. I loved it. It was a, it was small. I've not been back to Chesterfield for quite a while. Um, I can't remember the last time I went back to Chesterfield. But um, yeah, I, I enjoyed it very much. I don't know how long I was there for today. Do you know? Well, so you were here from, um, from uh, so you first from 76 and then you left in um, 79. So your, your last game was a, a defeat against Swansea in, in May 79. Was it 79? Okay. All right. Yeah. So was it not quite nice coming back up north then? Well, it was very nice. And... Uh... It, it was it was great, really. Is that Palace, as, as I said, I travelled uh, half across London to get from Southend to Palace, and again, it was it, it was the wrong thing to do. I should have done it different, and I take responsibility for that. And um, I'm just sorry that didn't work out. But Chesterfield was lovely. I moved over, with it, and that's what I should have done. Arthur Copps, uh, instead of travelling every day from London to Chesterfield, and I could have done it hmm. because it wasn't, it was more of a direct route. But Arthur said, no, you come live in Chesterfield, sell your house, and then it was, and that was the right thing to do, to be in the community, to, to live and work over there. Then all of a sudden you're saving travelling, you're getting a bond with the players, you're getting a bond with the supporters. And uh, it was nice. But unfortunately, I had quite a few injuries uh, at Chesterfield. But that was my type of game, you know. Nowadays, is that what happened is that if you lost the ball, you would dive in and get the ball back. And you were allowed to do that. So I was always stretching. And uh, I had a lot of injuries, which was unfortunate. But it was only because... I was stretching, getting the ball or whatever. So I'd pull muscles or break arms or break a nose, lots of things. Yeah. Well, yeah. Which which players do you kind of remember at Chesterfield at the time then? Were the players that you were really well, close to? 
I remember them all really, Andy Kowalski, Jeff Sammons, Rod Fern. Uh, yeah, we had big Stuart Parker, Phil Walker, and Ernie Moss, unfortunately, Ernie Moss died, didn't he, not too long ago. Yeah. And uh, as that was said, Phil Walker was a very good player, and I think Phil could have gone higher and further because he had good skills. Uh, Sean was a good lad. There was Rod Fern. Was you? You can't remember all these players, or can you? Well, doing this podcast is as part of the reason why I started it was just so that I could kind of fill in gaps of Chesterfield knowledge. Because yeah, I don't remember any of these players, but I no. kind of feel like I do now after speaking to them. And from Chesterfield, I came to Peterborough, but I, again, unfortunately, is that I only played uh, probably about a dozen times for Peterborough and what happened we were playing at um, Bristol City we stayed overnight in Bristol and in the morning we did some exercises where you had a partner who jumped on your bike and you ran around like a like a piggy bike as a race mm. and I had a partner who was Mickey Jim he played for Coventry with Steve Osgrovovich in the cup final and Mickey was probably five foot, three inches tall, weighed six stone, went through. And he jumped on my bike. And he was so light, it was like a, a fly. But unfortunately, he jumped the wrong way. And I slipped my disc. And um, that was my, my time finished. Because in those days, it took three years to fix something like that. Mm. So I didn't play again in English football. And um, I then, about two or three years later, out of the blue, I got a phone call from Hong Kong. And um, I got a phone call on a Thursday night at three in the morning. And I was in Hong Kong on Saturday afternoon. Simple as that, as quick as that. They sent me a ticket. I don't know if we agreed terms or what. I've got no idea. I can't remember. But I went over there and had a happy three years in Hong Kong. Yeah, that's that's. Oh, oh, yeah, I was going to ask about Hong Kong because I, I saw that on your uh, on your kind of list of clubs, and, and there's a few players that go out to Hong Kong, isn't there? What, what was the standard like? Was it was it an okay? Well, again, is that I went over and I was one of the first um, players to go to Hong Kong. Okay, there wasn't many Europeans out there at all that they brought out. Um, football was good. They had good skills, but they weren't organised. Everybody, it was like being at school. They all chased the ball together. Mm. But when they got the ball, they were very good. And there was only one stadium, which was the, um, the national stadium. So we'd always get a full house for every match. So there'd always be 50,000 people there every single match. If we're training and we trained at six o'clock in the morning, it was so hot over there, you'd get three or 4,000 people watching you train. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of people in such a small area. Hong Kong was overpopulated like it is now. And um, at six o'clock, busy, busy. You know, I landed in, in Hong Kong, I think, about 8 o'clock in the night. And I, I can't remember. I think it was probably when I when it was March that I got there. But it was just like Christmas Eve. There was lights everywhere flashing. And it was, I've never seen anything like it. It was like Oxford Street in, at Christmas. It was just magical. And I had three good years there. And would you believe is that we didn't earn good money in, in all the clubs I'd been, Peterborough, Chesterfield, Orion, Preston. But it, I earned more money in two years in Hong Kong than I did in 30 years in, in England. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had a great time. I had a, I had a wonderful time in, in Hong Kong. But I enjoyed myself in most places because I used to just throw myself into things. And again, my, my my whole game was, hey, just enjoy it and work hard and do what you can. 
And I, I would always say to players, do your magic on the ball. If you've got good skill, do your magic. I'll do your running. But if you don't do your magic, I'll give you a slap. OK, meaning is that I don't mind running and tackling for you. But, you know, if you didn't do your skill when it mattered, believe me, I'd have my say and I would uh, I'd get involved. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. You're, obviously, you're a real trailblazer as well as a footballer, because there's, I mean, right, uh, back then you were one of the first Asian footballers, weren't you, that was that was playing in the league? I was, uh, I was uh, the first Asian footballer, and uh, we came to England, Dave, uh, when I was, uh, mum and dad came in 1953, and I was three then, three or four then, but I loved football. It was like breathing to me. I would, I would have to play football, and I loved the physical side of it. So I embraced it all. I enjoyed it, embraced it, loved it. So it was. Mum and Dad never used to see me growing up because I would eat standing up, and go and play football. My dad would say to me, nine o'clock. So if my dad said nine o'clock, it was nine o'clock. So I'd come back at nine o'clock at night, go to bed, go to school at seven o'clock, play football for two hours and go to school. As simple as that. So my whole life was football. Yeah. It was yeah. just a love affair. But it was just like breathing. You know, you had to play football and the same with breathing. So for anyone that's seen you on, on Twitter, they'll see that you've got a you've collected a lot of really cool memorabilia over the years. With regards to football, oh, yeah. What it what it was is that unfortunately, and I include myself in this, football was a great life. It didn't. It taught you, and if you you just threw yourself into football, but it didn't educate you for the real world. Okay, most of us played football and uh, neglected our education, so we went straight to a um, a professional team at fifteen played football, but we didn't really learn anything whatsoever because our concentration was just about football. Mm. So when you finished playing football, you had nothing. You know, it was like being thrown into the real world and all of a sudden you, you thought, well, what am I going to do? You had nothing because no education or limited education. Yeah. So mine was always, I thought, I'll sell balloons on street corners because balloons always a happy thing, and I like things that make you happy. So I started selling balloons, and then somebody said, why don't you do this and uh, get a shop? And I got a shop. And then somebody said, why don't we have another shop? So I got another shop. And it all progressed from there. I, I, said, I saw a, a thing on a, on a message board somewhere that said it was you that released a 1,000 red balloons when uh, at Manchester United... Well, what happened is that we, so we opened a shop, then we opened another shop and bye, bye, bye. And things really was, it was just good luck. So business was good. We did, um, we got a big, some big contracts. Remember Liverpool had high school and got banned from Europe mm. and every other team got banned, English teams got banned from Europe for three, four years. So Manchester United and Aston Villa were the first teams to get back into Europe. So I got the contract that we'd released 10,000 balloons. It was 10,000 at Manchester United and 10,000 at Villa on the same night. So, and that's what we did. And we've still got the, the footage of that. So, and that was a nice thing. And then we did, again, we had John Major... Uh, was then came to power in uh, uh, in Huntingdon. He was the prime minister, and I got the the contract to do all his parties and functions and all his uh, tour things. So we followed John Major around the country uh, for about four four years and did all his work. And from then on, we got we did Princess Diane's. 30th birthday where we arranged everything so we did a lot of high profile parties and functions where we had to arrange everything so yeah we had our moments 
Yeah, so it's an amazing career after football. Well, it was, it was, it. Uh, but yeah, that was a good time. And uh, but now I'm completely retired now, and uh, yeah, and I enjoy retirement. Now I'm into my. Um, I've gone back, Dave. Really, is that uh, again? As I said to you before, I didn't learn anything at school. Nothing whatsoever. But now since I've retired, probably in the last five years, I've got a real thirst for knowledge. So I've gone back to, to school online and I'm doing my A-levels. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just infatuated. I just, I've got real thirst for knowledge and I enjoy it. my routine in the morning. I get up at seven o'clock with my wife and I start doing my study until about 12, 1.30. And then... My day begins, you see. So yeah, so that's what I do now. Yeah, it's a great attitude to have. I I, I read as well. Uh, this may not this this may just be a uh, complete rumor, but I, I saw somewhere that they said you you and some friends owned the rights to Garfield. Is there any truth in that? <laughs> well, yeah, we again. It was uh, what happened is that. Everything is more good luck than really. I wasn't looking for things. It was more Garfield came along and I, I knew somebody in Huntingdon and uh, Garfield was very, very new. And a, a soft toy or a, a cartoon character usually only lasts for one year, two years, but Garfield lasted for about 12 years. And at the time, it just took off and it was a license to print money. It really was. It was just, it wasn't sort of, you must try this. How many would you want? And it was all lots of things. And it was, it was just amazing. And I don't know if you can remember with Garfield. They, they brought out this Garfield uh, that stuck on car windows. Yeah, I remember, yeah. And it just went absolutely crazy. It was just... It was just a phenomenal time, phenomenal. And it lasted like for, for 12 years. So yeah, we were very lucky, yeah. very lucky. <laughs> Brilliant. Garfield, I need your help. Hmm, that goes without saying. We have to tell cats out there about new Alpo cat food. Hey, cat food is for the unimaginative. Imagine this, Alpo cat food so full of nutritious proteins Every serving's like a balanced seven-course meal. And the taste. I'll be the judge of that. So, Garfield, what would you tell cats about Alpo? Two. Demand seconds. New Alpo cat food. Canned and dry varieties. Tested and mm. approved. Well, yeah. it's, it's funny, you sometimes read these things and you think that can't be true. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was so... Yeah, I've, I've always been lucky, Dave. I've always... Uh, I've, just always been, you know, from one thing to the other. I've got uh, two sons now, um, and I meet them on, I live in Peterborough, so I go to London on Tuesdays. I meet them at King's Cross. We'll go and have a drink, and then we'll have another drink, and another drink, and then we'll have something to eat. So I'll catch the last train home, and uh, I'm three parts gone to the wind. <laughs> and uh, so I'll get on the, the the boys basically throw me on the train and uh, I get on the train and immediately I go to sleep immediately not sort of five minutes later but I've got this thing in me I don't know where it comes from once we get into Peterborough Station I'll wake up and off I'll go it's just like a, a zombie walking off and I'll get in a taxi and come home and uh, so that's always a funny thing but yeah I've always, but again, I'll always catch the last train. Don't ask me how. If I'm late, the train will be late. <laughs> and uh, but I always catch the last train home. And I've never, as yet, overslept. And because from the train then goes on to Leeds and then on to Edinburgh. So you can imagine it's. Uh, if I make one mistake, I'm in real trouble. I'm going to say you might you might wake up at Chesterfield Station. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I've. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Great, right. Well, to finish off, I just obviously you were at Chesterfield for for three years, and uh, and you scored a few goals for us, and you're obviously still well remembered by a lot of the fans. So, well, thank you. you, for still, that. you and I, uh, look out for the. Do you still kind of look out for your old clubs? 
all the time. Chester was a happy time, and I still I don't know they're not in the 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 in the non-league now. But again, it's just a matter of time. Uh, the the new st- when I was playing, it was Salt again. Mm. Uh, so yeah, the new stadium is the new stadium a good stadium. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, it's really lovely. Yeah, yeah. Just so yeah, I, enjoy, I loved my time in Chesterfield. It was a good, good time. I was very friendly with all the boys, and uh, yeah, we had a had a great time. Yeah, yeah. And Arthur Cox, I went to Peterborough, and Arthur Cox said to me, he said, "No, I don't go." I said, "Why don't you stay?" And sort of, I'll make you uh, a coach. You'll start off with the reserves, and we'll see how how far is going. But I don't know. He said it was a good offer, so I went. But Hey, who knows what would have happened? Mm. Yeah, well, I suppose Arthur went uh, went to Newcastle, didn't he? You might have been in the yeah. Anglo Anglo Scottish Cup team. <laughs> you know, who knows? Who knows? <laughs>